Okay, good afternoon. I do have some exams still here, about a dozen. So if any of you want yours. Yeah, if you want someone else's, you want to see the answers. I don't know. Some of them are pretty good. I don't know why they wouldn't want to come and get them. All right, before we start today, uh, John, who's not here today, so we'll point out that he's not here. He asked a good question last time. I didn't answer it the best, so let's revisit it. He said, you remember Muller's ratchet. When you pass viruses from plaque to plaque, you lose fitness because the population isn't diverse enough to restore... Uh, to restore any mutations that arise. And he said, what if you did that experiment with a, a virus with a mutation that made its polymerase m less error prone? So my feeling is that the decline in fitness would happen sooner because you would have even less diversity in the population. All right? So the whole problem with the decline in fitness is that there's a not, a, not enough diversity when you pick a plaque because there's only 10,000 or so viruses, right? So if you had a strain that made even fewer mutations, which is what he was asking, the, the fitness decline would just be quicker. So that's a good question that sort of illustrates the basis for um, that whole issue of the Muller's ratchet. All right, today we're going to talk about uh, emerging virus infections. And this is, in, in some ways, a continuation of evolution, but we're going to consider specific conditions that lead to new viruses emerging and um, We'll, we'll talk about some specific examples. Emerging virus, this word or this phrase was coined in the 90s. It never existed when, when I was a student, uh, but someone thought it up. But in fact, uh, viruses have been emerging since they evolved, whoever knows how long ago. So this is just a new term to describe something that's been going on for a long time. Uh, more or less since the rise of agriculture, about 11,000 years ago, we think that new viruses have emerged more frequently because uh, larger population centers have evolved and that facilitates uh, virus spread. Certainly virus infections spread among humans and prehumans forever, but um, more frequently as population centers grew. So an emerging virus can be one of two different things. One is it's it, an expanded host range of a virus, so it's an existing disease that um, is not very obvious, but suddenly its host range expands and then it becomes obvious to us. So that's one example of an emerging virus infection. Or it's a transmission of a new virus from a wild or, an, or domesticated animals to humans. So that's called a zoonosis. We've mentioned this term a couple of times so far. A zoonosis is an infection that goes from animals to humans. So influenza is, was technically at some point a zoonosis, and every time we get a fresh influenza virus from animals, that's a zoonosis. So many um, emerging infections are zoonoses. Sometimes this cross-species infection, which is what a zoonosis is, establishes a new virus for people. So the jump of, H of SIV from chimps to humans was a zoonosis. Now HIV is no longer a zoonosis because it's a human virus, of course. Uh, sometimes when you get these zoonoses, they don't sustain in people very effectively. We'll talk a couple of examples of that today where uh, the virus just doesn't do so well. And Ebola and Marburg viruses, uh, which spread from bats to humans, are examples. They infect people, they cause small outbreaks, but they never really transmit in the human population. And so they just simply don't adapt to be able to do that. Nevertheless, Ebola and Marburg are still called emerging infections. And there's always the chance, of course, that in some future, at some future time, these viruses will evolve to transmit uh, effectively among people. So the press loves emerging viruses because they are scary. So they make covers of magazines. Uh, so when Ebola first emerged, going from monkeys to people, was very scarily, scary, it seemed to be highly lethal. Uh, this, this book on the right, I think I've mentioned before, is about the emergence of Lassa fever virus in Africa in the 1960s, really good story. Um, probably one of the first emerging infections to be uh, written about in the popular literature. There's, there are many factors that drive the emergence of new viruses or new virus infections. We're going to talk about some of them in detail today. This is just a, a diagram listing them. Uh, physical environmental factors that affect 
not just virus stability, but the ability of it to be transmitted among hosts. Genetic and biological factors, this applies to the virus and the host, of course. Uh, humans and animals, their numbers, what kinds, where they are. Social, political, and economic factors, uh, if you have money to combat infections or not, for example. Ecological factors, whether you encroach upon uh, areas of the world that aren't inhabited by humans and theref thereby encounter new viruses. Uh, the specific microbes and viruses themselves and how they're evolving. So you'll see many of these emerge as we talk through today. Um, human population growth is a big one in teasing out new infections. This is just the photograph of, the, uh, of North and South America taken by the National Geographic Society. The whites are, are city lights. You can see extensive population areas. Uh, also on this photograph are um, fires. And of course, much of uh, South America is being cleared to make way for population growth. And you can see there are not many lights there right now, but there soon will be. So the growth of human populations has really contributed to the emergence of infections. This is just a pictorial way of illustrating some of the issues that I just mentioned. Um, air travel is a big one. It brings people to different places very quickly. Expanding populations, particularly huge cities with lots of people together and extensive poverty so that people don't eat well, they're not healthy, they don't get medical care. It favors infections and transmissions. Deforestation, uh, as I mentioned, the, the Amazon forest being deforested makes us encounter many new infections. Environmental changes of all sorts. Here, here the, the transport of tires globally spreads mosquitoes to new places. And ecosystems that we change by our activities can be disturbed and lead to new infections. On top of all of this is evolution. The fact that we talked about later that viruses are incredibly diverse, they make a lot of mutations, so they can adapt to any circumstance. So we make a lot of changes in our environment and in our interactions with microbes and they take advantage of it. They just slide right into these new niches. Global air travel is huge now. It allows a virus to circulate around the globe within a day, most likely. Uh, the networks are extensive and indeed when influenza, the pandemic strain emerged in 2009, uh, a great deal of its spread was along the air routes and you could actually map the outbreaks along the various air transport routes. Which is, now this is not to say that before we had airplanes viruses didn't travel. They certainly did and they traveled very effectively. But this just makes it even faster. So uh, again, just to emphasize the role of evolution in everything we're going to talk about today, the ability of viruses to be very diverse allows them to adapt to new environments and new hosts that are exposed as a consequence of human activity. So the variation we talked about last time, the selection, that was the theory last time. Now we're going to see it actually in practice, how uh, viral variabil variability allows them to uh, emerge as new pathogens. And here is a, a map of the uh, Amazon North re region of Brazil. And um, so here's South America, Brazil, and the North region, mostly the Amazon forest. And all of these names here are names of viruses that have been isolated uh, in different parts of the Amazon. And these are mainly in uh, pretty remote areas. Um, and they are isolated by the Chagas Institute in, in Brazil. And the point is that this is probably just less than a percent of all the viruses that exist here. You know, the, the animal life is huge in the rainforest and um, the potential for more infections is great because as we go in there and clear it and people live there, uh, they can get infections with many of these viruses. Now, not all of these infect people. But again, the fact that viruses can move into niches very readily means that we have to be careful. And we'll get back to this a little bit later. <clears throat> so here are, is a list of um, some what we call emerging infections. Uh, on the left is the name of the virus. And on the right are the, some of the factors that led to the emergence of these infections. And we will talk about a couple of these uh, in detail today. Um, for example, we'll talk about hantaviruses, which emerged as 
human contact with rodents increased. Um, Ebola seems to be uh, a consequence of contacts with bats uh, in Africa and also bringing monkeys into Europe and the US. The first outbreaks of Marburg and Ebola in Europe and the US were from monkeys that were imported for research and these ended up infecting uh, the monkey handlers. Often making dams or irrigation practices, changing irrigation practices leads to uh, climate changes that allow emergence. Rift Valley virus is an example of that. Uh, West Nile was introduced into the US uh, in a very hot summer uh, and probably spread under the right confluence of uh, weather conditions. And then there are many others as well. So you can see for each one there's a specific thing that we have done. For flu, uh, an integrated pig, pig duck um, agriculture. We raise pigs everywhere and, they, and the ducks which are wild birds have access to them. So we do things that increase our uh, chances of having emerging infections. So before we talk about some specific examples, let's go through some principles. And one concerns the general interactions, what kinds of interactions viruses can have with their hosts in very general terms. So on this picture, we have uh, four different kinds of interactions. We have a stable interaction, evolving, dead end, and resistant. So these are the four kinds that we talk about when we deal with emerging infection. So a stable is one that maintains the virus continuously. This can be in people, it can be in animals, or both. The virus has been there for a while, it has a known effect, and it's transmitted effectively. Uh, evolving interactions are the kind of interactions we see in emerging infections. So a virus goes from a stable interaction into a different host, a different animal, and then you have an evolving uh, interaction. A uh, dead end is when uh, a virus jumps species uh, but doesn't get transmitted serially uh, in that host, so it's a dead end infection. And finally, uh, resistant infections, where the virus gets in but there's no replication, no transmission, so infection is blocked. So the stable, in the stable host virus interactions, um, the virus and the host both are present, they both multiply. Uh, some of these are permanent, so we've known them for a long time, like measles virus, herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus, smallpox virus. These are all human infections, they don't seem to be animal reservoirs. These are stable infections in people, they've been going on uh, for a long time. And sometimes more than one species is involved, it doesn't have to be just one. So influenza virus, of course, goes from uh, birds or pigs to people. Uh, flaviviruses can uh, interact with multiple hosts and so can other arthropod-borne viruses. So that's a stable interaction. It's a virus that's infecting a certain species, can be animals, can be people, and uh, it's been going on a long time. The evolving relationship is when a jump is made from a stable interaction to another host, one host that's typically not part of that interaction. So it could be a virus that's been stable in an animal population for many years, then humans encounter it, it engages humans, it's able to replicate in humans, and then it begins to evolve. So initially you can have very pathogenic interactions, and then over time this stabilizes and becomes perhaps a stable interaction. So examples um, are the introduction of smallpox and measles to Native Americans by the colonists who came from the Old World. These infections were common in the Old World. They were brought across the ocean by colonists and their ships, of course. The Native Americans had never seen smallpox or measles virus. And as a consequence to them, this was a evolving infection. So it was introduced into them. It devastated populations, but eventually evolved to coexist with them. Same thing with introduction of West Nile into the Western Hemisphere. We talked a little bit about this before. It was present uh, overseas, came into the U.S., uh, probably on an airplane, and then spread across the U.S. very rapidly. So these kinds of transitions from a stable to an evolving uh, infection, they can be benign, they can be devastating, that runs the whole gamut. And sometimes during the evolution, the virus changes or the host changes, and that changes the outcome of the disease. Um, so famine or wars can also affect the virulence of a virus that's just been introduced into a population. Last time we talked about the efforts to eradicate rabbits in Australia. The first year it was a lethal infection, if you remember, and then it evolved to become less lethal. 
both the virus and the rabbits evolved. So that's an example of an evolving relationship because that virus was new to that population of rabbits in Australia. And so initially it was very lethal, but then this, the in interaction evolved. So a dead end interaction is when a virus uh, infects a new host uh, and may cause disease in that host, but it's not transmitted to uh, anyone else. So this often happens uh, in cross-species infections, not typically intraspecies. So when influenza goes from one person to another, it's not a dead end because we are all susceptible to influenza. Uh, when this happens, sometimes the host is killed very quickly, and that may explain why you don't get transmission. Or alternatively, uh, the infected host doesn't make enough virus to transmit to someone else. So whatever the reason is, there's no transmission. That's why we call it a dead end. So this happens a lot. It happens for a lot of vector-borne diseases. Humans or other animals are dead ends. Uh, and we don't spread the disease to anyone else. Which is not to say that it couldn't evolve at some point to spread, but this is a specific class of, of infections where we don't see that. and We call it a dead end. So here's an example of uh, these kinds of relationships. Um, here is a life cycle of an arthropod-borne virus. So it's a virus here spread by mosquitoes. That's what the word arbovirus means, ar uh, arthropod-borne. And this virus is transmitted among wild birds by mosquitoes. So the wild bird is infected. The bird is fine. It doesn't get sick. And another mosquito bites the bird, picks up the virus, and transmits it to another bird. So this we call a stable uh, host virus relationship. The virus is maintained in this population and is spread by mosquitoes. Not all interactions of this kind are without disease. This particular example, the birds don't get sick, but this could also, the birds could get sick and it would still be a stable virus host interaction. Sometimes the mosquitoes bring it, the virus to domestic animals, domestic birds such as chickens, and they may get sick, um, and mosquitoes may or may not pick it up from chickens and spread it to other birds. Other mosquito species can pick up the virus and bring it to other hosts. So the main cycle is a stable interaction, and there can be off-cycle events as well. Now, if the mosquito carrying the virus, which is picked up from a bird and bites a human or uh, a, a horse, these individuals can get sick. The virus can replicate them in them. So many encephalitis viruses transmitted by mosquitoes uh, cause encephalitis in horses or people. But those are dead-end interactions because the virus isn't transmitted to anyone else. Okay, so that's the classic example. It probably doesn't replicate enough in the people or in the horses so that if a mosquito bit them, they would get enough virus to transmit it uh, somewhere else. Another example uh, of these sorts of interactions, this is a virus called tick-borne encephalitis virus. It's transmitted by ticks among uh, many hosts, including rodents in this cycle. So here's a stable uh, rodent tick cycle. Uh, the ticks may also bite other kinds of animals, and they, they're part of the cycle as well. If you wander into the woods and you get bitten by a tick, you may uh, get tick-borne encephalitis. It's, it's present here in certain parts of the U.S. And, and other parts of the world. And you'll get sick, you get encephalitis, uh, but you will not transmit it to anyone else. Another example of a dead-end interaction. So for, we cannot pick, make enough virus or the likelihood that we will then be bitten by another tick that will transmit that to someone else. It's just so low that this is not an established cycle. But can you think of a, a cycle that is stable, that involves humans and mosquitoes? That's not this course, though. Oh, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Uh, is there another, is there a, it pro that's probably true, yes. So the, the humans are the reservoirs for malaria and the people bring it from human to human. How about a virus, though? One of the tires. Sorry? One of the tires, where it's in like the tire water. Yes, so one of the tire, yeah, which virus is that, do you remember? <laughs> Dengue would be one. It carries virus from human to human, right. Um, there doesn't seem to be a, a reservoir. Some people think there is a form of dengue that involves monkey reservoirs, but for the most part, uh, it's, it's human to human. So yeah, that would be a stable cycle where the virus goes from human to human, 
And it's not a dead end in people. It's very productive. The virus replicates really well in us, and then mosquitoes pick it up and transmit it to someone else. So other kinds of dead end infections, yellow fever, um, um, especially when picked up by a monkey, tends to be a dead end inf infection in people. Uh, a number of viruses that come from bats, Marburg Ebola, Hendra, Nipah, and the SARS progenitor, which we'll talk about today. Uh, these go from bats into people, and we, get, we can get sick, we can get very sick, but we don't spread the virus uh, to other people as far as we can tell. There may be one exception in here now, but for the most part, these are dead-end infections. Um, Lassa virus, Hunin sin nombre, these are all viruses spread from rodents to people. Again, dead-end infections. And they don't spread from people to people. Again, which is not to say that it won't happen one day. It could. A mutation could arise in a virus in some person infected with one of these viruses that allows it to be transmitted. But it, it hasn't happened. And really, an a laboratory animal models are dead-end infections for the most part. Uh, we infect an animal, a mouse, a hamster, a rabbit, and typically that's the end of infection. We don't usually do serial transmission experiments, um, and probably they wouldn't work. It's very difficult to get transmission of viruses in animal hosts like this. So animal, laboratory animals infected with various viruses are dead-end infections as well, but they are useful because we can study uh, what the virus does in them. So when, when a virus is about to emerge from one host cross into another, what has to happen? Well, there are two basic steps. You have to encounter the virus. You have to meet it from whatever host it's coming from. So it has to be introduced to a new species. And then it has to establish in the new species and disseminate. Because if it doesn't spread, it's not going to be an emerging infection. We'll never see it for the most part. Uh, and so it's not classified as an emerging infection. So you have to be introduced to the new virus and it has to replicate in the new host and spread among them. This happens probably, the encounters probably happen all the time. Um, probably even here in a city there are chance encounters with various viruses, certain, certainly not as much as in other places. If you went to the Amazon and walked around there, you'd encounter lots of viruses because there are many different kinds of animals bearing them there. But I suppose if you walk around Central Park and encounter a, a raccoon, you might encounter some other viruses as well. But most of the time, these encounters don't go anywhere. The virus doesn't replicate in you, um, and we never detect them. So an emerging infection like Ebola or Marburg only occurs, it gets our attention when bad things happen, when the virus causes disease. So if I go into the Amazon and I get infected, and the virus replicates either not at all or a little bit, maybe I won't get sick, or if I got a cold or flu-like symptoms, I wouldn't think twice and I'd go home, I'd be fine. I would never know that a, an infection had occurred. So this can happen over and over, and you don't think twice about it, and that's the end of the line for that virus. So single host transfections are not transmitted. I don't make enough virus to transmit, I don't encounter enough people. These probably happen a lot, and we never make note of them. But some of them, of course, um, end up going further. It's really rare, though. I mean, the number of new emerging infections that we can document in the last 20 years are really, really small in number compared to all the encounters that probably have occurred over the same time. Well, so what do you need to establish a new infection in people? Um, so beyond, it has, the virus has to get into you and find some susceptible cells, and it has to be susceptible and permissive so that the virus can replicate uh, and spread within you and eventually move to someone else. The factors that control this are among them population density and health. So if you are alone in the woods for two weeks and you encounter a virus, it infects you, if you don't see anyone during the time of shedding, you will never spread that <coughs> infection. Whereas if you go back into a big city and you're shedding virus and you encounter a lot of people, there is more of a potential for spread. So population density makes a big difference. If you happen to be unhealthy for whatever reason, you have a low immune t uh, system activity, maybe that would give the, the virus a chance to replicate better and, and make a foothold. So there are many factors that would determine whether a virus that's come into a new host is going to make it or not. 
And in the end, the most important thing is to have serial infections. That is, infections from one host to another to another. Uh, that has to happen, otherwise the virus will not become established. It will just cause rare outbreaks, and that's what happens with Ebola or Marburg. There are very small <coughs> outbreaks where there's very little serial transmission. With Ebola and Marburg, apparently, most of the transmission occurs in the hospital. Someone will get sick, they'll pick up a virus from a bat, they'll be put in the hospital, and before anyone can figure out what's wrong with them, they have infected all the people caring for them as well, and some of those people have gone home and to their families and infected them as well. Until we figure out what's going on, then we can stop this chain of transmission. So we have many new ways to meet new viruses, and we develop more and more of them as the years pass, and this is just a list of some of them. We talked about air travel, making dams, irrigation practices, um, wildlife parks, making wildlife parks where people can go and encounter animals. It's a good way to encounter uh, new viruses as well. Hot tubs, this is a relatively recent thing, but if you don't properly sanitize them, you will introduce new viruses uh, into you. Blood transfusions, uh, xenotransplants, getting organs from different species. Um, pig organs, for example, often used in reconstructing hearts, pig valves. Uh, they could introduce new viruses into you if you're not sure uh, what's in the tissue. You have to know what to look for, of course. Pig, pigs have retroviruses of their own, and so we wonder if, if they could be an issue. Deforestation, transport of livestock, uh, the way we behave in society, use tires, urbanization. Daycare centers is a big one. It's a good way for kids all to meet, which they never used to do at that young age, spread all their viruses and then bring them home uh, to their parents. So here are a couple of exa more specific examples of ways that uh, we facilitate transmission of infections. So <clears throat> here on the left is what we call the transmission parameter. That is how the virus or the infection is transmitted. So contact with bodily fluids of the infected host. So that's just one way you could get a virus infection. And things that would lead to this would be predation. Animals predate, prey on one another, of course, and they can pick up new infections that way. Well, we hunt and we eat wild game. Uh, if we go to zoos or animal parks, we can contact new viruses as well. If you get very close to the animals, uh, you can transmit infection. Many people kiss their dogs and let their dogs lick them, but the dogs may have viruses that they have picked up from other animals as well. Uh, sharing of a resource with a different species. Um, we'll talk about an example of how viruses are spread from bats to pigs and to people because the pig farms are built next to mango groves, which is the fruit that the bats like to eat. So this starts a cycle. Uh, sharing of insect or rodent vectors. Uh, Japanese encephalitis virus is spread by a mosquito that feeds on herons, people, and pigs. So one mosquito vector spreads the virus among different hosts. And finally, encroachment. This is a big one. We enter the jungle and we get bitten by mosquitoes that are part of a cycle. Remember, it's a stable cycle, mosquito, bird, mosquito. But we go in, we get bitten, we pick up a new virus. Most of the time, this is of no consequence, but every so often, it results in getting new infections, depending on how the virus goes. So let's talk about some examples to illustrate this. This brings it home more <coughs> readily. Uh, and this one involves this wonderful looking bat, the fruit bat. It's actually about this big. It's a big bat. You wouldn't miss this. It's not a little guy like this, right? It's a really big bat. The wingspan is like, like this. Anybody seen a fruit bat? Yeah. They're pretty cool. Um, but they have, they have lots of viruses in them, but they're fine. They have, they're okay with all these viruses. They don't get sick. And what happens is they feed, uh, we build farms close to where their habitat is and they end up contaminating the farm animals with their viruses. So since 1995, four brand new paramyxoviruses have been isolated uh, from these flying foxes, including two Nipah and Hendra viruses, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and these cause disease in, in animals, in particular horses and pigs, and can infect people as well. So paramyxoviruses are envelope viruses. They have a negative stranded RNA genome. Uh, and they, as RNA viruses, can evolve very rapidly. So Nipah virus was identified in Malaysia initially in an outbreak of 
respiratory and neurological disease uh, on a pig farm. So this was an outbreak of disease on a pig farm. The workers who care for the pigs, they get very close to the pigs. You know, they're, they're touching them and they can inhale their respiratory uh, secretions. Uh, the people who worked with them got sick. 105 people died. And uh, this initial uh, epidemic was stopped by killing a million pigs that were, in, were or were not infected, but they just stopped the, tra the chain of transmission uh, of the virus. So this started because the pig farm in Malaysia was built next to a, an area where there are lots of uh, mangoes, and the, um, the mangoes are one of the things that the fruit bats eat. And the fruit bats come to the mangoes, and right next to them are the pig farms, and so the, the, the idea is that the uh, uh, the bats urinate near the pigs, and the pigs get contaminated with virus uh, in the urine. We know that the virus is present in the bat urine. So the virus goes from the bats to the pigs, the pigs get sick, and then the handlers of the pigs get sick as well, and that's where the 105 uh, human dates, uh, human cases come from. So initially there was no human-to-human -human transmission in these initial outbreaks in Malaysia and also other areas, but now in areas like Bangladesh, there seems to be human-to-human uh, -human transmission. In Bangladesh in particular, um, a, a popular thing to, to drink or consume is date palm sap. Um, so this is the sap extracted from date palms, and these are kept in open containers. And so people who drink this can get uh, infection with Nipah, and it turns out that at night the bats go into these containers and they drink the sap and they contaminate it with urine and they put the virus in it, of course. And so then putting a cover on these is a very simple way to really cut down the number of infections. But in, in Bangladesh there have been human to human transmission, so maybe the virus has, is beginning to adapt uh, to be able to do that more effectively. Uh, a second paramyxovirus also seem to be seemingly uh, originating in fruit bats is Hendra virus uh, discovered in Australia in 1994. There was an outbreak on a racehorse farm, so a place where they raise horses to be uh, racehorses. Uh, this, the, the horses got sick and one of the handlers, uh, or the trainer I should say, uh, got infected and died as well. So again, these horse farms are in rural areas where there are bats, uh, in particular flying foxes. Uh, they spread the virus to horses. Uh, at night probably the bats come around and urinate, the virus gets into the horse, and then as the handler takes care of the horse, they get infected as well. So you can see in both cases contact with humans and animals. And these are just people that are caring for the animals, but respiratory and other secretions will infect them. Uh, the latest case of this, this virus continues to infect horses uh, in Australia and surrounding areas. Um, and these horses die and they're, they're, they are given diagnoses. Uh, they look at samples and they find um, Hendra virus in them. So it's a serious business because horse racing, of course, is a multi-million dollar industry and you don't want your horse to die after you've spent so much money training it. So there's now a vaccine in development uh, to be given to horses to prevent this. But it's hard to prevent it if you have your horse farm out in the wild because the bats are going to, to be coming in. So if you look at the distribution of the bat that's involved, you can get an idea of what's the potential area that can be infected. So on this map, it's a WHO map, um, the green line here is the range of one genus of fruit bats, terop teropus, so you can see it includes northern uh, Australia, which is where all of the cases of Hendra have been, these blue dots here. So the blue dots are uh, Hendra outbreaks. The red dots are, are Nipah outbreaks as well. So you can see they fit pretty much within the range of this one species. There have been some in India as well. Uh, a lot of um, Nipah in Bangladesh. S one case on um, Madagascar. So these, um, these red dots here are fruit bats that were positive for uh, either of the two viruses. No human cases here uh, in Africa yet, but the virus is apparently present uh, in fruit bats, so could infect people as well. So the point is that you have to know what the range of these animals are. By the way, the purple is a different uh, member of the same bat family, has a higher range 
includes the, this, this genus right here. So you, this is important information to know. If you know that this kind of bat is the host for the virus, you have to know what its range is, and then you have to make appropriate precautions to avoid uh, infecting people. Yellow fever virus is a, an example of an introduction changing uh, the way we are um, interacting with the virus and then the, the, the uh, consequences and outbreak. So yellow fever is typically a tropical disease, the Caribbean and south around the equator. Uh, in um, the 1700s, 1793, um, there was an exodus of former slaves from Santo Domingo. So it was an oppressive regime there. About 2,000 people left Santo Domingo and arrived in Philadelphia, and they brought with them yellow fever. So some of those individuals were apparently infected, and they got to Philadelphia, and of course Philadelphia has mosquitoes, and so you mix mosquitoes with people with a lot of viremia, and it can be transmitted. So there was an outbreak of uh, yellow fever in Philadelphia. It had not been for many years. Uh, you can see there was a peak in October of that year, 10,000 cases with about 50% fatality. Eventually, as the temperature drops, you know, here up in the northeast uh, in the winter, the mosquitoes go away as the temperature drops. And so that, that uh, signaled the end of the outbreak. But if Philadelphia were a tropical city with mosquitoes all year round, this would probably be there permanently. So that was the end of that outbreak. But it's just an example of how you can introduce uh, a virus into a new population and, and get an outbreak. Another example is uh, what we mentioned earlier. Uh, diseases of colonization. You have new world populations who are naive to viruses. They've never seen them before. When the viruses are introduced, they have devastating effects because in those new populations, you don't have a stable relationship between the virus and the host. So again, smallpox. Uh, smallpox was uh, originated probably in the Far East, reached Europe in, in 710, and then reached huge proportions, outbreak all over U Europe, a highly lethal uh, infection. But it wasn't in the New World. It was brought there by the colonizers. Uh, and of course, the most famous is the bringing of uh, smallpox to the Aztecs by Cortez. And um, this probably contributed by the to the ability of a small band of conquerors to, to take over millions and millions of uh, Native Americans. And probably measles infections also uh, played a role as well. Um, polio is, an, is another example of how changing environmental conditions can allow for an emerging infection. So polio, as far as we can tell, has been around since the Egyptian times, but it didn't emerge as an epidemic disease until the beginning of the 20th century. And we think that the improvement of general sanitation in the U.S. and other European countries, um, you know, other countries in Europe, contributed to this effect. So polio typically infects everyone shortly after birth when sanitation is poor and the virus can circulate in, in sewage, which isn't being taken care of properly, for example. Uh, but then if you improve sanitation, you now make, you build uh, plumbing facilities and you treat sewage and you do all of those things that developed nations do, you now delay infection to when you're five or maybe 10 years of age at which time the proportion of paralysis is higher. So all of a sudden you get epidemic polio as the virus is introduced into these uh, groups. So here's a graph of the annual number of polio cases per year. So you can see up until the early 1900s, very few cases of polio, just a blip here in 1890s. But then uh, 1900s, big outbreaks of polio and up to 20 to 30,000 a year in the US. And again, we think this is because we cleaned up our act in terms of sanitation. We delayed infection till later in life. This builds up pools of susceptible individuals. And it's also a time where infection seems to have a, a greater propensity for causing paralysis. So again, you change the environment in some way, you change the pattern of infection. Here's another example of a recently emerged uh, infection. Uh, this, in this one, um, probably we didn't have as much as a hand in some of the others that I've told you. This is a matter of changing climate and animal populations. And this is a disease called hantavirus 
pulmonary syndrome. It's a respiratory infection caused by a hantavirus, which is an envelope RNA virus, first found in the Four Corners area of New Mexico. It's where the four states come together. Um, it was first isolated in a place called Muerto Canyon, which is right in the Four Corners region. And the CDC was actually going to call it Muerto Canyon <coughs> virus. But the people who live in Muerto Canyon said, we don't want a virus named after us. So they tried another name, um, and they didn't like that either. So finally, CDC called it Sin Nombre, right? which pleases everyone. So the disease, the disease HPS, is called, caused by Sin Nombre virus which turned out to be endemic in the deer mouse, which is Paramiscus maniculatus. Okay? Um, the deer mouse carries this virus. It's not a brand new virus. It's endemic in the mice. In other words, it's, it's involved in a stable cycle, and it goes from mice to mice, and the mice are fine. They don't get any sickness from the infection. So here's a hantavirus to show you. It is a enveloped RNA virus. The uh, genome is in three circles. Uh, of RNA. So what happened to cause this outbreak? So this was the first time in 1993 that this disease has been seen uh, in the US. What happened? Well that year there was a lot of rainfall and one of the main crops in the area is pignon nuts. Right? Um, and so people would raise lots of pignon nuts, they would store them away and pignon nuts attracts mice attract mice. If you store them in your house, you get lots of mice in your house. So this year there was a big crop of pignons and there were more mice as a consequence. The mouse population increased. There was more uh, invasion of homes by mice and the mice excrete the virus in their urine. So if a mouse comes into your house looking for pignon nuts and urinates, the dust eventually will bring the virus to you. So the, the virus will dry out in the urine and if some dust is raised it infects you and then you get um, infected with the virus. So there's the mouse, that's the deer mouse Paramiscus maniculatus. So it's an accidental host for humans. Uh, the virus goes into humans, it's a dead end infection, but it's one of those dead end infections where it can be quite serious because the respiratory syndrome is, is often lethal. So this is a very, pretty rare disease. In fact, here's a map of uh, the case, total cases in the US as of 23, 349 cases in 31 states. So the green is the range of this mouse, Paramiscus maniculatus, and each of the R dots is a case of uh, isolation of this virus associated with um, Hanta pulmonary syndrome. There have been a few um, infections outside of this green area, but they, they are uh, mediated by a different kind of mouse. So again, uh, the same virus can go into another mouse species. There was actually a case out on Long Island a number of years ago uh, by a slightly different virus and a different mouse. So an example of how the, did I skip one? It's an example of how um, the changing weather can have an effect on mouse populations and therefore the introduction of a new virus into humans. Give me a minute while I change my batteries here. So hantaviruses are quite uh, prevalent in certain parts of the world. So this incident is, is really a warning that we have to be careful because if conditions change, some of these other hantaviruses can infect us very much like uh, hantapulmonary syndrome. Okay, uh, one more. Example. Not, not uh, having good luck. Okay, one more example of a uh, human emerging infection. This is SARS. So this is one that most of you have probably heard about. This is an infection that emerged uh, in 2003. This is an email. So ProMed Mail is a very interesting 
website where people send notifications of new diseases, mostly infections, but other kinds of diseases. So you'll see people involved in healthcare sending messages. And this is an email from February 23, where uh, this fellow uh, said he got this email and he found nothing that pertains with, does anyone know about this problem? Quote, have you heard of an epidemic in Guangzhou? An acquaintance of mine from a teacher's chat room lives there and reports that the hospitals have been closed and people are dying. So this was the first um, indication that something was going on in China. And this was the outbreak of SARS. It was an outbreak of uh, severe atypical pneumonia. So that is pneumonia more serious than usually seen of unknown etiology in this province in China, which had started in November of 2002. So word of it was just coming out uh, via these chat rooms to the rest of the world. This particular outbreak involved 305 cases with five deaths. Short incubation period, fever, chills, headache, malaise, malalgia, malalgia, <coughs> myalgia, typical flu-like syndromes. In fact, initially it was thought to be uh, influenza. Uh, and then a number of these individuals had very severe lung infections and needed uh, mechanical ventilation. This was eventually called SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And a Chinese doctor who had treated patients during this initial outbreak uh, traveled to Hong Kong in February of 2003. This is before we knew what the agent was. And this uh, physician stayed in the very fancy hotel in, in uh, Hong Kong called the Metropole Hotel, which is now infamous. You don't think it's very fancy, Saul? Have you been there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it's... Um, okay. Any, and anyway, it's now infamous because um, he, he died the next day, but he ended up infecting 10 people, 10 other people in the hotel. And this is an international hotel so people from all over the world were staying there and these 10 people flew to Singapore, Vietnam, Canada, US before they got sick. They, they arrived at their destinations, got sick and spread the virus to other people. So this was the catalyst for the spread of this infection uh, globally. Eventually it spread to 8,000 people in 29 countries with a 10 percent mortality rate. So if you ever go to the uh, Metropole, ask them to show you the room where the doctor died of SARS. Okay. This is the map of the cases spreading from that individual. That physician here, uh, he's case A. So he had treated people in China at the initial outbreak. He went to Hong Kong. And they could trace infections from him. Um, they knew what floor he stayed on. And they could trace infections to all the other guests who then went on to other countries, Canada, Ireland, US, Singapore, Vietnam and eventually infected other people as well. Very interesting um, example of good epidemiology. So uh, the vi virus was eventually isolated, shown to be a novel coronavirus. So we'd known about coronaviruses before. They are enveloped RNA-containing viruses. They have glycoproteins in the envelope. They have very, very long RNA genomes. These viruses have the longest known RNA genomes, up to 30,000 uh, bases long. And we know that in people, coronaviruses can cause uh, respiratory disease. Uh, but this was a brand new one. We'd never seen this one before, and the disease, the severe respiratory disease, was brand new. So in humans, uh, these are the, some of the, these are the human coronaviruses that we know about. There are many more in animals as well. You can see they mainly cause um, respiratory diseases, either upper or lower tract infections. And here's the SARS coronavirus, which causes atypical pneumonia. So it's a very different pattern from all of the other uh, coronaviruses. The way these viruses are acquired, they're transmitted by respiratory droplets. You inhale them. Uh, the virus goes in your respiratory tract, multiplies in the epithelium. This is all, all stuff you know uh, from this course. And eventually causes lung injury, goes all the way down into the alveoli. And there, of course, it causes pneumonia. We don't understand yet why it causes uh, such severe disease. This is a map of the uh, Hong Kong outbreak, 1,700 cases, uh, which uh, ended in June of the year. So here's the initial start in February of and by June it was over. So a lot of uh, effort went into containing the infection. There were no antivirals or vaccines, but uh, simply restricting travel and education played a big role in, in restricting the spread of this virus. So here, here are the case counts as of the end of the outbreak. You can see. Uh, 
China and Hong Kong had the most cases uh, and other areas, Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, Australia, uh, some in Canada and the US brought there by one of the people who stayed in that hotel in Hong Kong, spared South America and uh, Africa. So this had a big impact on Hong Kong. In fact, just before the, um, the outbreak, there was this, this travel poster was seen, Hong Kong will take your breath away. <laughs> <coughs> and indeed, SARS did. Uh, this, this, is the, uh, this is a photograph of the Hong Kong airport. So uh, this is a very crowded airport, so this is highly unusual for it to be empty, but travel was curtailed as a consequence, and that probably played a big role in restricting the spread. Of course, that physician and it, the, the people who contacted that physician traveled because at that time we didn't know what the agent was, but shortly afterwards we were able to restrict it. Uh, there was a lot of airport screening done. Um, facilities were set up to screen people to see if they had fevers. And they put up scanners that could tell if you had a temperature over a certain uh, number, you wouldn't be allowed to leave. You'd have to go back to your hotel and stay there until your temperature went away. So this would be done in the airport to restrict the spread. And there were many uh, informational campaigns taken out where posters of various sorts were put up and to inform people that if you have these symptoms, you really need to uh, not travel and try not to contact other people. So the public health responses to this really helped limit the infection. Um, this included epidemiology, surveillance, early warning, uh, tracing each of the cases as from that initial Hong Kong hotel, travel restrictions, quarantine, you can't leave the country if you have a fever, public education. So this was really essential because we didn't have a vaccine and we didn't have uh, any antiviral agent. So good example of how um, an infection was limited. 8,000 cases is really not a lot considering the, the population of the world. So where did it come from? Um, before the outbreak, uh, sera collected before the outbreak from people does, doesn't have antibodies to the virus in it. So the implication is that this is a newly introduced virus into humans. And the people, there, is, there are uh, open meat markets in the area of the first outbreak in China. And these individuals who work in these markets were some of the earliest cases of SARS were in those individuals. So that gave a clue that it may involve some of these uh, animals themselves. And eventually it was shown that these traders had uh, significantly higher levels of antibodies to the virus. And I think that's shown here. So here are antibodies to people from this particular province according to occupation. 40% uh, of the wild animal traders, these are people who go and catch the wild animals and they're sold to the markets. Uh, the people who slaughter them, 20%. If you handled vegetables, you didn't have a high chance of getting infected because in, uh, vegetables, of course, are not infected uh, with the virus. And the control, uh, which is a, uh, uh, people who work in a hospital without respiratory infections had no antibody. So this pointed to some risk factor being involved with wild animal trading. Uh, at some point, virus, the virus was isolated from this animal, uh, the Himalayan palm civet, which is one of the animals that's caught and provided to the live market for sale and consumption. And there was some evidence that perhaps, uh, epidemiological evidence that some of the human infections had correlated with the presence of these palm civets. So many of them were killed and destroyed and they weren't allowed to be brought into the market for a period of time. But it turns out these are not the reservoir of the virus. All the viruses isolated from these palm civets are much too similar to be uh, a, an established virus in an animal population. So they all had very high identity and they often could not isolate the virus from civets in the wild or on farms. They only would get it from the meat market civets. So after a few months of investigation, it seemed unlikely that the civet was the source of the virus. However, um, looking at a different kind of animal population uh, provided the clue. Uh, and, this, and so investigators started looking at bats, naturally. And they found uh, a number of SARS-like coronaviruses from different kinds of horseshoe bats. So different species, not our fruit bats, but horseshoe bats. And these were isolated from areas 1,000 kilometers apart. So it's not likely that they resulted from infecting one another. And a high number of bats had antibodies to this virus. 
And uh, the sequence identity showed a bigger range than in the viruses from civets. So this could be a population of SARS-like coronaviruses existing in these bats. So it has greater genetic diversity in the bats than humans or civets. So the idea was these bats are the reservoir uh, and they are transmitted uh, in the market. The, the, the bats are in the market contaminating the civets that are brought there for sale. And then it went from uh, those animals to people. So the bat is the reservoir of the SARS coronavirus. How did it adapt to humans? So many, many isolates were, were identified and sequenced to try and get an answer to this. And what it looks like is that um, it, it deals with the receptor, virus receptor interaction. So the glycoprotein of these coronas are known to be uh, determinants of species infection. They infect many different animal species and the glycoproteins control that. And the uh, human and the civet strains have only four amino acid differences in the part of the viral glycoprotein that binds the receptor. And these account for a very high difference in affinity of binding. So the receptor for the SARS coronavirus is this protein called human angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. So basically what we think happens is the precursor virus to human SARS coronavirus in the bats has a few amino acid differences in the receptor binding domain so it doesn't bind human cells well and it doesn't infect people. But a mutant emerged that was able to bind very well to the human receptor and that is what ended up being the human SARS coronavirus. So let me show you a cartoon of this. So here is a picture of um, the interaction of the SARS glycoprotein on the bottom with the human receptor ACE2. So this is the receptor on the cell and these are different viral glycoproteins. All right, so um, here for example is uh, the human SARS spike interacting very well with the receptor and this is the virus that was isolated from severe cases of, of SARS. Now the civet SARS, the precursor, has a couple of amino acid changes in this interface which makes for poor receptor affinity. So this, the civet SARS itself will not infect human cells very well because the receptor interaction is poor. But again, just a couple of amino acid changes here in the spike glycoprotein allowed high affinity binding with the human receptor and that's probably what allowed uh, these viruses to establish themselves in humans. Um, this one here is an isolate of uh, human SARS virus from very mild cases of the disease. And this doesn't have uh, the right amino acids at the interface to make a strong interaction. So again, the severity seems to correlate with how strong the viral glycoprotein interacts with uh, the human receptor. So will it come back? There hasn't been any SARS activity uh, since that outbreak. Uh, the most recent case was a laboratory acquired infection in China in 24. Someone was working with it in the lab and they infected themselves, which is not good. It gives us a bad reputation. Right? Um, there were some, sorry, there were some cases in uh, 24, um, slightly before that, which were due to new animal human transmissions. In other words, the virus is still out there in bats. And if we aren't careful how we deal with the meat markets, we're going to get increased transmissions. These, so the viruses are still circulating. The meat markets have all opened up again, and people are buying them. They are buying the various animals. So the possibility remains for another outbreak. But this time, we're prepared. Uh, we know what to look for, although we still don't have a, a vaccine or an antiviral. People have been working on them. So presumably, next time, we could contain such an outbreak even better because we know uh, what to look for. Um, if any of you have a dog, you'll be interested in this story. Uh, this is canine parvovirus, and if you have a dog, you should immunize it against this virus because it can kill uh, your dog. I understand that Oprah's two dogs died of canine parvovirus infection, and if she had immunized them, they wouldn't have died. <laughs> so um, canine parvovirus didn't exist before 1978. It's a brand new virus of dogs that evolved from a cat virus. So in dogs it causes, it affects the gut and the heart, causes a lethal infection. It evolved from a cat virus called feline 
panleukopenia virus. So it causes leukemia in, in cats, infects cats, minks, and raccoons. And this virus evolved to infect dogs. So it emerged in 1978 and actually spread globally. We're not sure exactly where it emerged, probably somewhere in Europe. And within six months, spread completely around the world and infected virtually all, all dogs that were susceptible. Um, and what people did after the identification of the virus in 1978, they began to collect sera from uh, early dogs and other individuals earlier. They had banked sera available from the 70s, and they could see that the precursor to the virus was circulating in dogs as early as 1970. So the virus is spread by fecal oral contamination. And in order to go from cats to mice, no, <laughs> cats to mice, from cats to dogs, only two amino acid changes were needed in the uh, part of the capsid that binds the receptor. So here's the parvovirus, small single-stranded DNA virus. The receptor is the transferrin receptor. So it's a cell surface protein that binds transferrin. It's the receptor for the virus. The cat virus binds the cat transferrin receptor. Two amino acid changes in the cat virus now allowed it to bind the dog transferrin receptor. So remember, these viruses are undergoing variation, not as much as RNA viruses, but they still vary. And at some point, a variant emerged that could now infect dogs. And you can imagine it's very easy for a virus to go from cat feces to dogs, right? Because dogs are putting their noses in everything. Uh, they can get infected, and then the dogs spread it in their feces, and uh, people spread it on the bottom of their shoes. So you step on some dog feces in Paris, you get on a plane, you come to New York, and you bring the virus to New York. This probably happened. So this is why it spread so rapidly in two years, and you only needed two amino acids in order to do that. So really interesting example of uh, how um, new viruses emerge. And we were able to get the almost entire history of this one because we had all these serum samples uh, available, and it happened relatively recently. So we had the technology to do this. So that's, that's an important point. Technology also allows us to identify new viruses. So we think they're emerging, but they've actually been around for a long time. But now technology allows us to discover them. So for example, Calissi viruses are little plus-stranded RNA viruses that cause about half of all the uh, foodborne outbreaks of gastroenteritis. Remember, the rotaviruses cause a lot of gastroenteritis as well. Uh, these do as well, 23 million cases a year. These viruses are not able to be cultured in cells in the laboratory. So we could never discover them because we can't grow them. But when we developed techniques uh, to grow them, to, uh, to identify them, then we pick them up. Um, these, uh, we get these infections from contaminated food and water. Food handlers are often excreting them, uh, often from aquatic theme parks and cruise ships. So cruise ships are a very typical way of getting these kind of gastroenteritis infections. We talked about those uh, theme parks because those big fishes and mammals that they have there, the killer whales and dolphins, they typically are infected with these and they can cross over to you. So next time you sit in the front row so you get splashed at one of these aquatic parks, you know, think, think twice because you may get <laughs> a calissi. Because they look, they excrete 10 to the 13 particles a day. There's one, there's one in San Diego, it's a famous one, right? Where they, they stand on the nose of the whale. Um, so those were discovered because we developed recombinant DNA and PCR to de detect them. We couldn't de detect them by growing them in cells because we couldn't grow them, but recombinant DNA and PCR allowed it. Same thing with rotaviruses. They were discovered in the 70s because we couldn't grow these, but we could see them under the electron microscope. So recombinant DNA and PCR allow you to find new emerging viruses, but in fact, they've been around for a long time. So they're not really emergent. It's just that our ability to detect them is so. So you can see there are lots of opportunities for virus, for new infections to emerge. So all the viruses are out there that uh, we can encounter. And whether any of them take a foothold, we don't know. But we have to be ready to detect it. Rapid response, as you saw from the SARS outbreak, is really crucial. And so this slide emphasizes that. You can detect these infections, but it costs money. It costs a lot of money to do this. So only developed countries are going to be able to, to do this. 
you need to support research in both industry and academics. You have to develop early detection uh, technology. You have to do a lot of sequencing of what's out there and put the sequences in a database so that people can query the database when they find a new sequence in the wild and they want to know what it is. First responder actions, all those things that were done in uh, China to limit SARS spread are very important to do. Uh, if any vaccines or drug stockpiles would be useful, they have to be maintained. Quarantines cost money. And this involves cooperation at many different levels. And of course, all of this was the subject of contagion because what we've talked about today is really the topic of the movie Contagion, that is the emergence of a new virus, its spread and how um, governments are able to, to deal with it. So there's a lot of science involved in this, but also non-science stuff as well.